Oh, it's that time, Karen. It's the midweek edition of Legal AF, only on the 2 Million Strong Midas Touch Network. We curated a great show for you today with a little bit of an audible that Karen and I did right before we got on the mm -hmm. air of the stories at the intersection of law, politics, and justice that we just have to talk about and inform our audience about. And they will include the New York Attorney General case. No, it's not old news. You've got Letitia James, the New York Attorney General there, saying if Donald Trump doesn't post his bond, and we'll talk about the bond amount, plus interest, plus 120%, if he doesn't do that within the time allowed, she's going to start seizing his assets. And for people like Karen and I that have worked on seizing assets, we're going to tell you what that all means. Plus, can Donald Trump even get a bond? And is he going to come up with the over $500 million in cash that he would have to post if he can't get a bond? We'll talk about all of that. Then we're, we're going to talk about mar a -Lago. Has, after a year of us patiently waiting, has Jack Smith finally cornered Aileen Cannon, the judge there? There are two appeal, possible appeal issues that are coalescing all in the same week. One has to do with her, um, what Jack Smith and his team have referred to as clear error and manifest injustice by Aileen Cannon in her order two weeks ago for Jack Smith to just tell the public the names of all the secret grand jury and other witnesses that are currently under, under protection. Just release that, not give it just to Donald Trump. Tell the world by filing it on a public docket. That violates law. That violates the standards that are applied in the 11th Circuit and other places. And Jack Smith filed a motion for reconsideration, warning the judge that if she doesn't change her mind and make the right decision, they are going to take her up to the 11th Circuit on a standard that she's committing manifest injustice and clear error. And then She's making a series of rulings about the Classified Information Procedures Act, what we like to call around here, or Ben likes to call around here, the SEPA stuff. And on the SEPA stuff, here's how it works. One page out of thousands, if she screws up, that gives Jack Smith an automatic right to go directly to the 11th Circuit on an appeal and at the same time ask to have Aileen Cannon removed. Will he? Talk about it here with my co-anchor, Karen friedman Ignifolo. Then... We're going to talk about a guy named Smirnoff. No, not that one. Al Alexander Smirnoff, who you never heard about, except he was the heart and has been the heart of two major proceedings that you have heard about. David Weiss, the special counsel appointed by Merrick Garland for whatever reason to go after Hunter Biden, have been relying on Alexander Smirnoff, who apparently is a Russian asset who's, who is hell bent on interfering with our U.S. election and trying to stop Joe Biden from being elected. How did he do that? He told the feds that Joe Biden, when he was vice president, took a $5 million bribe, and so did his son, Hunter Biden. The only problem with it, it wasn't true. That didn't stop MAGA Congress, like James Comer, using this fake, false news or information to open up an impeachment proceeding against Joe Biden. In fact, they claimed it was the smoking gun. The smoking gun has now flamed out. And in fact, it forced the special counsel, David Weiss, to turn around and prosecute, indict and prosecute the very confidential informant they were using against Hunter Biden. And that was the heart of the impeachment. And then we've got some hanky-panky going on in Nevada, where the magistrate judge made an interesting uh, uh, ruling about whether Alexander Smirnoff should spend time in jail before he goes to trial or should be out with an ankle bracelet. And we'll talk to you about developments related to that and as they touch on Hunter Biden. And then, because that's what Karen and I do, we just like to do jazz riffs. We may touch on some other things that are really, really important to our audience. And we'll just see whatever comes to mind. We're going to do this extemporaneously, as always. This is this is one take. High Wire Act that we like to call the midweek edition of Legal AF with your co-anchors, Michael Popak, and one of my best friends, Karen Freebick Niffalo. Hi, Popak. Hey, Karen. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Where are you these days? Are you in... I'm, I'm in New York, oh. and I want to give a shout out to my dad and my stepmom in Palm Springs or Palm Desert, I should say, where they live. They are watching us live because we're doing this live. So they're watching us right now. And I, I wanted to say hi to them. I love them very, very much. And I also wanted to 
uh, mention that I my two necklaces that I wear are my dad served in the United States Army, and he also was a Los Angeles police officer. He worked for LAPD. Um, and so my dad is a public servant uh, as well. And when he retired, we found his uh, uniforms in a box somewhere. And my sister said, look, there's these beautiful, I don't know if you can see them, these beautiful buttons. This is the army one. This is the LAPD. There's five of them. And he has five daughters. Let's get them made into necklaces. So I wear them. They give me strength. They remind me of my dad, who is the heart and soul and strength of me and really the best person I know. So dad, I love you. Thank you for being our number one fan and Tony, you as well. I love you guys. So thank you for letting me, letting me say that to them. And now we can talk about the issues. Yeah. Everybody knows my, my strong relationship with all my family. My dad passed, but he was also army go army and had a army burial, um, uh, not at West Point, but um, locally with us. And so family is really important where we wouldn't be literally where we are if it wasn't for a strong family and strong family values. So of course, welcome to, <laughs> to Mr. Is Mr. Friedman. Is that what you call yes, him? Yes, it is. No, he is his, yes, it is. Mr. Friedman. <laughs> Addie Friedman. Okay. And now uh, let's, um, let's uh, make his night with his daughter here with me and talk about the first topic, which is right in your neck of the woods. I'll frame it and turn it over to my favorite uh, uh, former prosecutor on on any network, Karen Friedman Ignifolo. So <clears throat> all that's left is the shouting. We've already got the judgment. In New York, we call it something different. I know sometimes we label it as the verdict or the judgment. Nothing. It wasn't a verdict and it wasn't a judgment. A verdict comes from a jury. A judgment hasn't yet been entered. The thing that came out is what we in New York colloquially call the DNO, the decision and order. I can't tell you how many decisions and orders that Karen and I get in our cases from judges. And it looks just about that. This one was 92 pages. It went on with findings of fact because Judge Engoron was the trier of fact because there was no jury. And he made conclusions of law. That's what we call it. Find that you find facts and you conclude law, uh, applying the law to the facts. And then you have a remedy section, usually, or a relief section, in which the judge spells out in the DNO what he wants to ha have happen next as a result. And here the judge was applying the remedies that are available under the case law of New York and the statute of executive law 63-12, which allows for disgorgement, which is the clawing back of ill-gotten gains, not damages, but money that somebody shouldn't have benefited, shouldn't have kept as a result of an, un un an unlevel uh, playing field, in this case caused by fraud by Donald Trump, that's disgorgement. And then the ban that we've all talked about in prior uh, hot takes and prior uh, legal AFs, including over the weekend, when we had all three anchors. <clears throat> all that gets reflected there at the end. The monitor, the use of the monitor, the expansion of her powers, the creation of the uh, independent compliance director and his role or his, her role, all of that, that's all baked in there. But it's not a it's not a piece of paper that you can go and execute on and take to your local sheriff and say, hey, go collect the yacht, the boat, the art, the building, the money, the whatever, because I've got a judgment. Because if that were the case, the sheriff would say, let me see what you, let me see that piece of paper, because they're looking for magic language, which says a judgment entered by a clerk. And the DNO is not a judgment. And so now there's a fight about what the judgment should look like, now, that, which should not be a fight at all. We'll talk more about it when 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 Karen comes in. But that's what we're waiting on. We're waiting for the judgment. Once the judgment is entered, which should reflect and be based on the 92 pages of the decision and order by Judge Angoron, then Letitia James can go execute on that and go and go take 40 Wall Street or whatever she's whatever she said she's going to do to to up to the amount of the judgment, which is running with substantial interest. I calculate it at about four to five hundred thousand dollars per month until it's paid. And that interest keeps running even on appeal. In fact, if he posts a bond, which he'll have to do if he wants to stop the execution of the judgment once entered, the only way to stop that during the course of an appeal is to post a bond. We call it a supersedious bond. All it means is an appellate bond that stops the enforcement of the judgment temporarily while the parties continue to litigate on appeal. If you don't post the bond, and a lot of people don't or can't post the bond, they can't afford it, then Assets can be collected. If the appeal is successful, the assets will have to be returned. But that's what happens in the interim. For right now, um, 
at least if you listen to Alina Haba, which I try not to, but, but, but if you listen to her false bravado, we have all the money. We have the $500 million. We're going to post it. All right. Well, she's going to have to post 120% of the almost $500 million judgment as of a week ago. Plus it's running with daily high interest. You have to project interest, compound that into the amount. And then you got to either get a sucker bet, get a bonding company who's going to lend you money on some asset that you think you have, which is all under the monitor of Barbara Jones, who's the federal judge that monitors all assets of Donald Trump. Um, or you got to put up all the cash, all of it. Um, and so that's a lot, even for Donald Trump, because he may have a lot of real estate that's valued at weird, inflated, manufactured numbers, but he doesn't have a lot of cash for a guy of that level. I mean, if he's got $400 million and $500 million in cash, that would be a lot. And the rest, he's going to have to go like hat in hand and sneaker on foot and whatever the, hell, whatever the heck else he's doing to try to collect new money and then use it to post his bond. So we're going to talk about all of that and this little fight that's going on. What are, what are you making of, Karen, of the this kind of move towards the judgment, post-judgment, execution on the judgment? And do you think, I'll leave it on this one, do you think that he's going to scrape up the $500 million or so and or get a bonding company to do it at risk, if he doesn't, of losing one of his buildings? So it's kind of fast. This whole part of the process is utterly fascinating to me and should be to everybody because as you said if he wants to appeal and he wants to make these arguments that he's been making about how the judge and the law secretary are are somehow biased and and that he didn't get a fair trial and on all the things that he's been saying it's fascinating to me that he's going to have to put up about 120 percent of this judgment which will be about a half a billion dollars right he'll either have to put it up in cash or he'll have to borrow the money or get the money somewhere else through a bond and what's fascinating about it is if you remember one of the parts of the judgment in Judge Angoran's ruling is that he can't borrow money from any uh, lending institution, financial institution, a bank, or a financial institution that is chartered in New York. And most, if not all, are. And so that really limits where he can get money from. So what's his net? So either he has cash in hand or he has to get a bond and you ask yourself who's going to give him a bond right it's some percentage of the money but also it has to be secured by the prop by property up to the amount of the judgment now bonds people don't like real property that's not something that typically they like to get or take because it's so fluid and frankly, how would that even work, right? How would they even value the properties in order to secure the loan, given that so much of the valuation is fraudulent because the entire ruling was based on the fact that these properties are fraudulent. These properties are also le highly leveraged. So there isn't as much equity in each of the properties. It's not like he could just put one of them up. He'd probably have to put multiples of them up because they are so highly leveraged and have uh, mortgages out on them. So it just poses a logistical problem. And then the final thing that I think is absolutely fascinating is if you remember in on Saturday when the three of us did a Legal AF episode, and it was so fun doing it together, there was so much going on that week that that it was just fun to all, all get on uh, Legal AF while you were on your baby moon uh, in the beautiful sunshine, Popox. So it was great that you, even on vacation, you, you work. Um, you never stop working. But anyway, it was it what's fascinating to me. And what I said on Saturday was to me, the thing that was most significant about the judgment was the installation of Barbara Jones as the monitor, partly because she is so highly respected and she's a former federal judge and she's just somebody who even if even if judge angoran is um he, he writes very flowery and he's very dramatic and he has a colorful personality and and he, and and like like many state court judges sometimes gets reversed every once in a while uh and and 
Barbara Jones is one of those people who in some ways is bulletproof. She has a reputation that is uh, regarded by all. So if she makes decisions about things, uh, I think I think by putting her in the position of making decisions, I think it really makes his judgment almost bulletproof. But what's fascinating about it and what, what's fascinating is in the context of what we're talking about, if Donald Trump wants to sell any assets to pay this judgment, he has to ask her permission. He has to go to her first and he has to get her to agree because she is the independent monitor who's going to be monitoring all the finances. And again, remember that this entire case is about fraud in these assets, right? It's all, it was all about, uh, about based on fraud and and lies lies about whether something is w whether a building has is fully occupied or whether something is residential versus commercial right mar-a-lago it's he it's it's he valued it as, as if it's a residential property, but it's actually uh, commercially, it's a commercial property that has to be for all time. And, or the, or the size of one of the apartments that was triple the size, you know, it's all lies. So, so it's just gonna be fascinating to see how logistically he does this and how he does it in 30 days, right? He only has 30 days to appeal. And if he wants to appeal, he has to do that. He also has to make a, a calculation, a business calculation does he want to do this and accrue all this interest, right? What is it? I read somewhere it was $87,000 a day <clears throat> and it's compounding interest, which means that number goes up, right? Because it gets added on to the total and that whole thing is then the interest is, is, is compounded over time. So from a business perspective, is he going to do that? So I, I find it more just fascinating. How is it going to, how is it going to play out where, the the ill-gotten gains, these these profits that he has to disgorge because of his uh, his persistent business fraud that he that that happened. How how is he going to logistically do this? So well, go ahead. Say, what I loved about Angoron's decision is that it, was, it reminds me of Gulliver Gulliver's Travels, where the Lilliputians just pinned down Gulliver. You know, he wakes up and he's just pinned down, and and it wasn't by accident that Angoron gave the monitor Barbara Jones more robust powers, um, established a, um, a director, an independent director of compliance, meaning somebody that has to install and make sure that proper control functions are present within the organization. And um, all, the, all of Donald Trump's assets are not just kind of um, loose in the ether. They all exist within his at his trusts and the trusts are also part of what Barbara Jones gets to keep an eye on. So you're right. It's not, he's going to have to get permission because now he has to ask in advance the monitor, not just report after the fact. That's one of the other changes in the order. And she, he can't just like sell off a piece of property because he did that before to her. And she had a report um, that they're not respecting the monitor. That won't happen anymore because if it does, they're going to run into court for contempt because the judge will have ongoing jurisdiction over this matter in case he screws up. It's not just going to be Barbara Jones going, please, and writing increasingly nastier letters. She has a recourse. She is a court officer that's been appointed and she will run back to Angoron. And so where does he come? But he has no choice from a business standpoint. If he doesn't post the 500 million plus, 120% of 500 million that he either gets in cash or a combination of a bonding company giving him credit, which is dicey right now, considering he's just got convicted of six, I'm sorry, seven counts of fraud in his financial statements concerning his assets. So what bonding company in the right mind is going to lend money? Maybe a MAGA bonding company. So maybe he gets half afloated to him in a loan under with secured by whatever assets he can figure out what he can pledge. Um, and then he has to, because if he doesn't post it, Karen, then Le uh, Letitia James has already been on ABC news giving an interview yesterday. And a couple of us did a hot take on it where she said, Oh no. I, oh, Oh yes. I heard when Donald Trump in his depositions and Don jr said, Oh, you want to see one of our buildings? Open your window, open your window there. There it is. 40 wall street. See that big, beautiful building across the street. She says, yeah, that big, beautiful building across the street is across the street from my office too. That's how windows work. I see it. And uh, that would be the first place I'm going to go. Here, Mr. Sheriff, here's the judgment. 
go put a padlock on 40 Wall Street and sell it at auction. And then you only get up to the amount, but the amount is like running. So they sell 40 Wall Street for, let's say, $100 million or even $300 million. He's still short. So she goes to Trump Tower and she, she goes and takes the triplex, whatever size it is. And then, OK, we're still short and the interest is still running because the interest is still running until every last dime of that judgment is paid. OK, I'm, I've been involved with my law firm in going after assets uh, for huge judge for huge judgments. One of the things that my law firm does, for instance, down in Miami, shout out to my partners, is that we have an anti-terrorism practice which is what it sounds like. We go after terrorist organizations and collect on behalf of victims of terrorism. And, and my partners are expert at finding the money in United States banks and getting it and back to the victims. So if you ever want to find out how to go seize a building, a boat, big bank accounts, you know, my partners in Miami know how to do that. So, and I've done it, I've done it in the past too. I've seized the yacht. Um, and so that's what you got to do. And, and it, you have the right to continue to go. You can't get more than your judgment with calculated compounded interest, but you don't get less either. Until By the way, I love your, I love your visual. The I've seized a yacht. I'd love to see that. I have a, I have a question for you. Um, so what would, what would, yeah, I just saw in the comments, someone said, take his plane. I guess. Yeah. That, that's yeah. something, you know, it's yeah. worth it's worth some money. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, I've read somewhere that people say that um, that he can declare bankruptcy, and and get and and so can you just take us through all yeah. that? What does that do to to this? Well, because he's a he's a recidivist. He's filed for bankruptcy. I was on Mike. I, I did a take with Michael Cohen. I'm going to be on Mea Culpa with him. We talked about it because Michael was there for most of it. He's declared bankruptcy five times. If people think he's some sort of super, not our people, <laughs> other people think he's some sort of superstar business person. He never was that. The only person that was a successful developer in that family was named Fred, and he inherited his first 500 million. Um, and then, you know, look what he did with it, um, including a persistent fraud in his operation and almost overthrew democracy. So he he's one of the he's one of the few people in America or in the world that found a way to declare bankruptcy three times running three three of the times running casinos in the United States that manufacture money where the house always wins he found a way to to put multiple atlantic city properties into bankruptcy and he was at one point when i was a young adult and kept an eye on Donald Trump before I knew I was going to have a podcast one day. Uh, he was put an allowance of $50,000 a month back in the 80s uh, by a bankruptcy judge. And at the time, I thought, wow, that's his allowance? That's crazy. But so he's no stranger to bankruptcy code. The problem with bankruptcy is we're back to all roads lead back to Barbara Jones. He is not just going to be able to file. There's something called bad faith filing in bankruptcy, and it's a bad thing. <laughs> and so you, you have to have your debts have to exceed your liabilities. I'm sorry, your liabilities have to, where am I tonight? Your liabilities have to exceed your assets. Let's try that. Okay. And so Donald Trump, who claims to be a three billionaire, okay, three, last I looked, three billion is bigger than 500 million. So he doesn't have the ability to file for bankruptcy. Rudy Giuliani is a different story. He has a $148 million judgment against like a, a fuzzy lifesaver in his pocket, 42 bucks and change, a bunch of old cigars and a watch. He is a perfect candidate for bankruptcy, not for intentional torts. So I don't think it works for him. But I, so let me just say it this way. That idle speculation about bankruptcy, despite the fact that Donald Trump um, filed for it before. That's because the individual entities that he owned, you know, Trump uh, Resorts, Trump Palace, Trump this, Trump that, they were technically bankrupt because their liabilities exceeded their assets. But we're talking about Trump Org, Trump Donald, um, and Trump, uh, um, what do you call it, trust. They're not because even though he's not liquid in the sense of cash, he claims to have, even at I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't stand up in court under oath and then in the uh, case in, in the case involving E. Jean Carroll, uh, which came out with sworn testimony, and tell the world that you're a multi-billionaire and then run to a bankruptcy court for protection. So I don't even think that. I've given it more time here than it's necessary. He ain't. He doesn't have the grounds to go bankrupt, and that would be a bad faith filing. And the creditors could go in there 
and convince the trustee and the bankruptcy judge that it's a bad faith filing. And that's a bad thing, including a crime. I don't think Donald Trump's doing that. He's either going to scrape up the money. I don't know from where, including from MAGA and PACs, although they're almost busted at the present time. And he's got to post this money in T minus like 25 days. Well, I think it actually starts from when the judgment is entered and the judgment hasn't yet been entered. So let's say the judgment judgment is entered in the next four or five days. He's got until the end of March, beginning of April, to scrape up the cash. And if he doesn't, I am sure that Letitia James and her crew are working hand in glove with the sheriff to like the day he misses that deadline to go seize an asset. What, well, I have one more question. Sure. <laughs> Will we know when the Eugene Carroll, because that clock is ticking, the yes. Eugene Carroll 83 million. Will we know whether he, what, when he posts that? Yep. Uh, yes. And you're right. That is, that's on a different time track. He's got to post 83 and a half plus interest at 120%. It's like another hundred plus million dollars. The last time he had an E. Jean Carroll judgment, because he loves E. Jean, he likes collecting E. Jean Carroll judgments. He likes defaming her as a misogynist. And then she gets new judgments against him. Well, the one from last May, the last time we were on vacation, remember that one? Um, he posted cash because it was only 5.2 million. So he's like, oh, I got that. It's that's like my my grandfather used to call it call it. That's my folded money. That's my. I always make Trump sound like Foghorn Leghorn from the old Warner Brothers cartoons. I don't know why, but he's all oh, I got it right here in my in my pocket because he didn't want to go for the bonding because you got to apply and post assets. Now all Letitia James has to do is go to Barbara Jones and say, can you hit print and print out for me all of the bank accounts, all of the assets because she knows. She knows where all the money is hidden. She knows that, where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> 14 months of being a monitor. Really? 15 months of being the monitor. This is the easiest collection that Letitia James will ever have. And you will see her with a big smile on her face, rightly so. Because Letitia James, just to do a shout out to her for a minute about strong women taking down corrupt men, which is a good thematic on the show, especially when you and I are, are, are teamed up here, is that Letitia James is going to take down in 2024 Donald Trump, financially and otherwise, and the National Rifle Association, which, you know, I used to, yeah. I used to lose sleep over the NRA mm -hmm. and their impact on, on policy. And she's going to put both out of business in one year. I mean, I, I don't know what she wants to do after the, the attorney general position, but she's going <laughs> to have quite a body of work to run on, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, she's, she's, uh, she's amazing. We're very lucky to have her. Absolutely. So we'll we'll continue to follow on hot takes and updates about when the judgment is finally entered and the clock is running and the money posted for Donald Trump, which will exhaust all of his cash. And speaking of cash, you know, there's a calculation that he'll be out of all the money in all his packs to pay his attorney's fees by July. So this is one of the reasons he's he's very upset with Nikki Haley, because every dollar he's got to spend there. And every dollar he has to pay on his attorney's fees and post bonds is one less dollar to go against Joe Biden in the general election. hes I'm telling you, when those numbers come out as we round into the summer, Joe Biden's going to have a $500 million advantage in terms of fundraising. It's going to be like 500 to 200 million. You don't think he's going to sell all the $500 million worth of shoes? <laughs> By the way, okay. He didn't. He didn't design them. He doesn't own the company that's selling them. It's a licensor. Just like by the way, everybody. they're ugly too. I and mean, who would wear? I'll tell you who's not wearing it. The kids that are in the 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 kicks market who booed him mercilessly at Philadelphia Sneaker Con right. are not are not wearing these things. I saw Brett posted. Uh, maybe it was just internal with us. Oh no, he, he put it on his on his social media feed. There's uh, some artist did a, a custom version of the Midas Brothers on a pair of Air Force Ones, you know, like an, uh, Jordans. And he's like, these are much cooler than those. But, <laughs> but uh, the whole thing, the fact that he did it the day after the judgment came out, that's such whistling past the graveyard. Such like, oh, well, I'll just sell a thousand shoes. That'll pay the. No, it won't. Yeah, he needs the money. I mean, <laughs> clearly. So I also saw a GoFundMe, and I also saw somewhere. Who knows if any of this is even true? But that uh, that that um, Louboutin, you know, those shoes oh, yeah, yeah. that have the red bottom, that they're going to sue him for the red bottom sneakers. I mean, <laughs> it's just crazy. He needs another suit. And then like, <laughs> the last thing before we turn to our next topic is, you know, people are also worried. Oh well. Joe Biden's um, Securities and Exchange Commission approved finally the merger of um, Truth Truth Social oh, right, yeah. the media company that Trump 
owns 98% of with a public company. And there's a bunch of suckers there that invested on this thing. Um, and on paper, he could, Trump could get, I've heard, I've seen the number. It's like ridiculous, like two or three or $4 billion. However, <laughs> There's a lot. We'll talk about it at another time. He has to hold it for a year. And if he's a twice convicted felon by then who's lost the presidential election, I'm not sure he's getting four billion dollars for the truth social. I'll just wow. leave it at that. Do you have any? It, all, it also <laughs> it also doesn't help him uh, right now when he needs. Right. Some right. That, right. That's again, he's he's pushing up his nose at, you know, at the candy store. Can't get that. Can't get that money fast enough. And by the way, just back to the bond issue and then we'll move to the next topic yeah. or to an ad. Probably Salty's probably saying it's time for an ad. Um, but one more thing is the other reason no one's going to bond him is what if god forbid he wins the presidency you can't what are you gonna go after the president's uh one of his one of his real estate holdings or his residence i mean it's just logistically it's not possible he's gonna have to come up with this cash somehow <laughs> the bond imagine the bonding company padlocking the white house that's not right. gonna happen though i don't want to have that <laughs> that hellscape in my mind because that's right. not i know i know but i'm just it's just when you think through all the different you know if you're a if you're a bondsman yeah, that's what you're thinking right <laughs> we're gonna talk about <laughs> coming up Coming up here on the midweek edition of Legal Layoff, we're going to talk about uh, Mar-a-Lago and developments there that could finally get Aileen Cannon off the case. I got a theory about why she's had such a light footprint over this case for so long, maybe inviting her removal. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll float that at the appropriate time. And then we're going to talk about um, Alexander Smirnoff, who he is, why he's so, um, why his indictment is such a blow, thank God, to the impeachment, the fake impeachment proceedings against Joe Biden and ultimately impacts uh, uh, Hunter Biden's efforts to try to get his indictment dismissed by the very same special counsel. And we may touch on some other things that are out there that, that have developed um, that we posted earlier, like in Alabama with um, embryos now being considered to be people too, and what that means for um you know, uh, what that means for, for women's rights, basically. And we'll do all of that. But first, we have a, a great group tonight of, of pro-democracy sponsors that we curated. Um, and so I'm pleased to take a break for them now. It's demon time on prize picks. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. So you can turn $10 into 1000 Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play hit prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. Prize picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Prize Picks is really simple to play. I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. Prize Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account. I've had an absolute blast putting my skills to the test and competing in not just football, but all the daily fantasy sports Prize Picks has to offer. Just last week, I went on Prize Picks and selected Steph Curry for more than 29 points and Nick Jokic for more than 10 rebounds. I nailed it! Go to prizepicks.com slash legalaf and use code legalaf for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash legalaf and use code legalaf for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature 
all night long. Using silver-infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo legal AF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF and use the code legal AF to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash legal AF to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Thanks. Thanks to all our sponsors for sponsoring this episode because without them, it would just be you and me chatting mm-hmm. away which we did before we first started the podcast we used to laugh i'll just tell a little a little little uh a side note here we used to get on jordy jordy for those that don't know jordy is the um the brother that is responsible for our ads and our relationships with our advertisers and it's amazing the job that he's done and shout out to jordy who's a new father along with his wife and um just does spectacular work but when we started you know, I, I did the show for free for about two and a half years in terms of having absolutely no sponsors whatsoever. And we used to get on Jordy and laugh with him. Like, you know, we'd have a sponsor and then like weeks would go by and we'd have no sponsors whatsoever. And we'd say to Jordy, Jordy, what happened to the sponsor? Are you getting it? And he would say something like, we love Jordy. Like, I don't know, it's a vernal equinox and sponsors don't don't advertise during that between that and summer i'm like what <laughs> but and i still laugh with jordy about it but thank god he's built a stable you know yeah. business model here i and mean he- you know this is what a grassroots movement looks yeah. like i mean truly yeah. <laughs> people so. think people think it's good when you and i are split screen because they love all your paintings but they think one looks like donald trump the one in the you know, middle of yeah yeah the you know yeah it's it's funny um it's funny. I don't. You can't see it when when we're split screen. You have to. Uh, you there have to go it is. To me. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I've seen that in the comments before. I'll have to ask the artist. His name is Ben Linovitz. He's uh, this great local New York artist who, who I love. His mom actually owns this amazing store in um, in New York. It's called Fish's Eddie, and Ooh, they have just incredible oh. dishes and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Fish's Eddie's amazing, and um, it's it's just one of my favorite stores and they're huge pro democracy i mean mm-hmm. their products and their advertising and it's always if you go to their window on 18th and broadway you'll see some kind of political message that's always hilariously funny but always very pro democracy and i just love how involved they are in the community and in the movement and anyway so um so the the, the son of the owner is this great local artist and and so i bought some of his work and i'll have to ask him if that's donald trump because if it is i certainly don't have it up there on purpose because it's him so yeah and i don't want people freaked out by it so let's speaking of freaked out um the um special counsel jack smith was freaked out by aileen cannon's most recent decision about two weeks ago in which she thought nothing of uh, violating another, uh, making another cardinal sin for the, a judge overseeing a criminal case. She thought it'd be fine if the prosecutor not only turned over to Donald Trump to fashion his defense, all of the names of the witnesses, including those that are protected by grand jury secrecy laws, just put it on the public docket. <laughs> Why not? And she cited a bunch of cases in her order and said, you know, based on these cases, you should do that. And and uh, you, should, you have till five o'clock tomorrow to do it. And he said, I, I mean, they must have, I can't even imagine the commotion at the DOJ and in Jack Smith's offices when this order came out about how they were going to handle it. But then, you know, once you are handed that, you can either treat it like poison 
or you can treat it like a gift. And they've decided to treat it like a gift because they've been looking for a way to get back to the 11th Circuit because they haven't yet done it on an Aileen Cannon decision. We'll talk about her light footprint in a minute up in Fort Pierce, a little sleepy, a little sleepy town up by Lake Okeechobee. I mean that in a positive way. I mean, I practiced up there. I've been to Fort Pierce's courthouse. Um, she should never have been assigned this case. It's the way the wheels spun. Uh, there was only a couple of judges that could have landed on for that that northern division of the of southern district of florida and um don middlebrooks was sort of busy in west palm beach and it ended up in her lap but she's never handled a confident uh, a classified information procedures act case a sepa case of course she's never had a former president be a criminally indicted uh person a defendant in front of her and um so they've been they've been chomping at the bit for her to really step into the bear trap and it looks like she did because that decision uh, as they noted in their motion for reconsideration, was based on an improper, um, clearly erroneous application of the law. And in, and in our jargon, we call that clear error. And clear error is what it sounds like. It's reversible. And uh, it's so patently clear that the judge um, is also admonished uh, it can be admonished by her bosses at the uh, circuit, at the appellate division, in this case, the 11th Circuit, um, who's already already admonished her twice before the case even went to the indictment phase uh, when she interfered improperly with the search warrant execution and overrode her magistrate judge who, who reports to her about these issues and was told not once but twice by two separate panels, three judge panels of the 11th Circuit, including one that included the chief judge prior that she needed to back the F up my words, and get out of the case and get out of the prosecution's way and let them get to a grand jury and an indictment and then let everything, all the chips fall where they will. The issue now is um, why did she impose a higher standard on the prosecutors than the law requires in order for them to keep the names of the witnesses um, confidential? given that Donald Trump, as noted by the magistrate himself that reports to Judge Cannon, noted that Donald Trump is a frequent uh, person who attacks with vitriol and violent rhetoric, judges and prosecutors and witnesses and grand jurors and staff and families and everybody else. I mean, even Aileen Cannon has received a death threat. They just prosecuted in Texas, a woman who who phoned Aileen Cannon's chambers and threatened to kill her. So it's not like she's immune to uh, what's going on around out there. And so they told her in her paper in their papers, the the special counsel, judge, now you've done it, clear error and manifest injustice, which should have set a chill down, if not Aileen Cannon's back, her law clerk's back, because if they're right, okay. Um, then she's going to have a, she's going to be uh, reprimanded, and maybe more by the Eleventh Circuit. And the second one, then I'll turn it over to you, Karen, about whether you think the Eleventh Circuit's going to bounce her at this moment and get a, a proper judge in charge of this. The other thing is she's dealing with these SEPA Classified Information Procedures Act issues on thousands of pages of documents, and she has to get it right on every one because just one page of the wrong decision is enough for them to take an immediate appeal to the Eleventh Circuit. And she's been holding these. We don't know much about them because they're in a black box. They're these secret confidential hearings, sometimes with just the prosecutors without even the, the defense present. That's how serious these Classified Information Act issues are at Mar-a-Lago. But there, she's about to make a ruling. What do you think happens if he gets a bad ruling, Jack Smith and SIPA, on just one page? And combined with Friday, we're going to know, and we'll be able to talk about it with Ben on Saturday, we're going to get Donald Trump's response to the motion for reconsideration as to why the witnesses should be disclosed to the public and then the, the right up for the appeal. What do you think happens? What does Jack Smith do? If you're a former prosecutor. And then what do you think the 11th Circuit does with the problem named Judge Aileen Cannon? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. First of all, there's, there's a third rail for a prosecutor, which is uh, witness and jury tampering or safety or threats. You can threaten law enforcement. You can threaten the prosecutor. It doesn't go over well, and it's, I'm not saying it's okay, but uh, prosecutors will tolerate a lot. Judges will tolerate a lot. Law enforcement will tolerate a lot. When it comes to witness safety and protecting your witnesses or or the jurors, that that's the third rail. And so, so there's that. Number one. Number two getting a judge, knocking a judge off a case 
is hard. Normally it's, it's up to their, you know, you have to ask them first, if you will, but, but ultimately to get, uh, to get a judge kicked off a case that's very high standard. And she's done some things that are beyond reversible and she's been reversed as you, as you pointed out earlier, which is um, when you, when you gave the, the intro to this, you, you talked about how in the beginning of the case, she inserted herself and gave herself jurisdiction over a search warrant execution before there was even a case. And, and she doesn't have that, that jurisdiction. And, and, um, and she was, she was admonished and smacked down and reversed um, already. And she's made a lot of other questionable rulings, but nothing that would get her kicked off the case. But she's starting to head in that direction, right? She's 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 slow walking this case, even though she hasn't taken the, the case off the calendar for trial in May. Everybody knows there's no way it's going to happen in May just based on how she's conducting the docket, right? She's She's um, she's clearly not acting in such a way that this trial could even go in May, but she's so uh, disingenuous that she's not taking the, the trial date off the calendar the way Judge Chutkin did, knowing that there's no way the case can go now, right, in, in March, given the fact that it's on pause uh, with the Supreme Court. So 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 she's being disingenuous and she's and she's um, and she's making all these questionable rulings. But Jack Smith is is sort of sitting back and waiting because it's such a high standard and so difficult to do, waiting for her to make it so that it's absolutely uh, irrefutable that she'll have to be removed. And these are the two things that could do it. One is putting witnesses and not just witnesses, but also the a, a bad SEPA ruling is now you're putting the country in jeopardy. You're putting national security in jeopardy. You, you do that and you go to the 11th circuit, that, that doesn't fly. She gets, I think she gets removed from the case. So he's just, I think they're just waiting for her to, to make such a move. She's no dummy. That's the one thing I will say. She's she's not she's not she's not a dummy. She's inexperienced, and I think she's also um, I think she's also has a point of view that is non-judicial and is absolutely um, pro pro or. or I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily want to accuse a federal judge of, of something I don't know, but her rulings to me seem to suggest that she has a bias and you're not supposed to have a bias when you're a judge. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be fair and impartial and call balls and strikes. And, um, and she doesn't do that, but so she, she puts witness safety in jeopardy. She puts uh, federal investigations in jeopardy, and she puts our national security in jeopardy, she gets bounced. I think she knows that. And so I think she's going to reverse herself. Yeah, I agree with it. She's going to have to reverse herself. But she's just going to be embarrassed at the 11th Circuit and more. That'll be, you know, I, I practice regularly in Florida and federal court. We have like a lemon law when it comes to judges based on case law and three strikes. And especially on a, on a case like this, I don't think the 11th Circuit's going to hesitate. The good news is, and I did a hot take on this one, it doesn't take um, even um, an actual proof of bias because that's so difficult, almost impossible to prove. Uh, I've had a judge removed uh, filing a motion for disqualification. You can't even cite to bad rulings against you um, or even patterns, but you don't need it here. In the 11th Circuit, as in most, case, in most places, um, if a judge demonstrates, um, for instance, just a series of rulings where she's driven the case into a stalemate and or has boxed herself in by her own making by internally inconsistent rulings, that could be enough for the 11th Circuit to remove her and find that she's over her skis and this and she's over her head here and take her out, which is good because trying to prove bias against somebody, we can all idly speculate. I mean, that's part of what the podcast is about. <laughs> but, but in terms of proof, hard proof, that's a little more difficult. But fortunately, under the standard that's applied in the 11th Circuit, uh, they don't need to do that. They can just point to her decisions, including this one here. She has two choices. That's why it's such a sword over her, over her neck. If she doesn't 
uh, grant the motion for reconsideration and change her order after listening to Donald Trump on it. I don't know why she hasn't done it already. Frankly, she doesn't have to wait. She can do it what we call sua sponte, uh, avoid the embarrassment. But if she doesn't find a way, if she doesn't do it, then she will get removed, I believe, at the 11th Circuit after Jack Smith takes an immediate appeal. And, and also they'll move to stay her order because they don't want to disclose the 12 witnesses. And if she doesn't grant it, I believe the 11th Circuit will in order to hear the issue. And then they're going to be slapping their forehead up at the 11th Circuit like, oh, we're back with Alien Cannon again. What, what did she do now uh, on this case? And then I think, you know, they have the right under their powers as an appellate court, as all appellate courts do over the trial courts that report to them. Um, as part of the administration of justice to change horses here or change jockeys, if you will, uh, related to it. Now, I have a theory. I want to get your view on this. Um, one theory that we've been running or positing on the podcast and in hot takes, and I know Ben especially subscribes to it, is that she's she's carefully avoided making any appeal. Uh, uh, appealable orders in order to stretch this case out, slow foot it, slow walk it as an advantage to Donald Trump. That's a theory. There's another theory I came up with when I was doing a hot take recently, which is because in the case law, it basically says that one thing that the appellate court looks at to determine whether they should replace the judge is how invested the judge is in the case in terms of their rulings. Well, let's look at and whether there'll be a waste of judicial resources, scarce judicial resources, if they remove the judge now. Well, think about how light a footprint she's had in this. There hasn't been the motion to dismiss practice in front of her, so she hasn't had a rule on it. The immunity issue, which we know is coming. He's immune, presidential immunity, presidential act immunity, sovereign immunity, separation of powers immunity, and all the stuff that's a dead bang loser um, over in the D.C. election interference case hasn't been raised yet in Mar-a-Lago. So she hasn't had a rule on that yet. Um, and then, of course, the SEPA issue. So when you really think, you know, she's masterful in the sense that for a year, she's been tying Jack Smith up in knots, much to his chagrin, making very few rulings. But that also favors removing her from the case that she's not diligently, she's not so invested that switching now would, would hurt the case. In fact, quite the opposite, putting a proper jurist in charge of this case is the only chance America has at getting the trial before November. And I think that may weigh into the minds of the 11th Circuit. Karen, <laughs> what do you think about my theory? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's as good as any other. You know, it's it's so interesting because I, I found myself when I was talking about her just now struggling because I, I, it's hard to talk about, it's hard to say negative things about a federal judge or a judge, right? It's hard. And I realized that I realized, God, you know, because you're trained as a lawyer, right? You, you, The judge is like this person who is above everything. They're not an advocate. They, they're sort of, they do the right thing and, and you can't say anything negative about them. And I realized just how uncomfortable I was saying anything negative. And I just want to point that out because look at the quality and types of, and I'm not unusual, by the way, that's how every lawyer I know practices, practices, like any lawyer that's legitimate. Think about his lawyers, um, some of them. Think about Alina Haba, for example, how, how she parrots and mimics the language that Donald Trump and, and, his, and his supporters do, going after judges right? That that just should show you and tell you kind of what kind of lawyers they are and what kind of people they are. So I just wanted no. to contrast that. No, I, and I, listen, I, I'll be frank with everyone. We, we don't blow smoke or sunshine here. I, I told um, people that are involved with the show that it makes me uncomfortable critiquing a federal judge that I can appear in front of. I practice in Florida. I'm a member of the Southern District of Florida. I've appeared in front of other judges regularly. I've tried cases in West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale and in Miami. I've had hearings in Key West. I've had hearings in Fort Pierce where she sits. I could just as tomorrow, I could have a case in front of Aileen Cannon. So it makes me uncomfortable. And the fact that we're willing to use our goodwill and credibility to the limit, because there are ethical limits to what we can and can't say about a judge, um, frankly. But it's not a judge that we're in front of, but it's a judge that I will appear in front of one day. Even but, if you didn't, you don't want to tear down the institute. Like judges really? are kind of above the fray. They're apolitical. They, right? Like it's just, yeah. this is not, it, it, whatever. This is I would just never think to do any, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a comment recently where I called out Chris Kice and his, um, 
unruly, uh, inappropriate, unprofessional, misogynistic uh, attacks in and, and, and made a mockery, just dropped his pants and took a dump on our beloved New York court system and our judges yeah. as a carpetbagger. And I'm not a carpetbagger. I practice in New York and Florida. Chris never practiced a day in his life in New York. He wouldn't know the CPLR from CPR, um, which is, <laughs> that's an insider joke for New Yorkers. The CPLR is our civil procedures laws that we refer to. My, Chris doesn't know that. He's a Florida lawyer. And you know what? He's a good, he was a good Florida lawyer until he pulled this shtick, as you said. You know, anybody that gets into the orbit of Donald Trump mimics him. But the difference is he doesn't have a law license that can, that can get pulled. And he's not a professional or an officer of the court. And they are. And he should be ashamed of himself going after Judge Anguaron and going after that poor principal law clerk. Um, and I've never seen it. I mean, I listen, I bit my tongue plenty with judges. I bit my tongue plenty with federal judges, but at the end of the day, the person wearing the black robe has exactly. your entire case and your client's potential liberty, you know, in the palm of their hand. And you need to, um, you need to sublimate. I don't know if that's not the right word. You need to um, uh, get your ego out of there uh, and make sure you're doing the right thing for your client. And you're a professional, you're supposed to be, and of an honorable profession, you're supposed to be. And I would never think to ever act like that. If a client ever asked me to act like that, and I've had clients say, do this, do this. And I'll say, okay, first of all, yeah. that's a loser for you. And I have I have a career and I have to appear in front of these judges and I have to be an honest advocate. I'm not doing that. And yeah. if I'm not the right lawyer for you, that's okay. And I fired clients over this kind of dialogue you know, Alina Hobb will be like, "What well, fire a client. I would, I would never, there seems to be no boundaries that she thinks ever get crossed by any client, but people like you and me fire clients all the time because we're not comfortable with representing them in the world that which we operate. But, you know, let's talk more about, um, magistrate judges that maybe have made mistakes. We'll talk about Hunter Biden. We'll talk about Alexander Smirnov being a Russian asset, trying to interfere with our elections and what the special counsel, the, the Hunter Biden special counsel is doing about it and the impact on Joe Biden's quote unquote impeachment by MAGA, who have nothing better to do. They can't pass a bill to save their life to help uh, honest Americans. So they got to run around trying to get airtime doing stupid bidding of Donald Trump. But all of that, after another word from our sponsors. Support for today's episode comes from OneSkin. If you're still feeling the stress of the holidays like me, you know it can really take its toll on your skin. But OneSkin can help your skin bounce back with science-backed TLC that refreshes and reverses signs of aging from the inside out, something women my age need to be on top of. Their products are powered by scientifically proven peptide called OS1 that targets fine lines and wrinkles right where they start, which is your cells. This isn't just another skincare routine, it's real science breakthrough. In fact, OS1 is the first of its kind to actually turn back the clock instead of just masking the signs of age, aging. With their full line of face, eye, and body, and sun, and travel size products, here they are, I actually love them, and people always say to me, I can't believe you are 57 years old, and it's mostly because of my skin and I take care of it, and this is a really fantastic product. It is. It doesn't just promise healthier skin, they prove it, and I am all in. I love using One Skin as part of my nighttime routine before bed, I'm absolutely thrilled with the results. My skin not only looks more refreshed and healthy, it feels soft too. Just cleanse and apply twice daily. One skin, uh, you can put it on your face, your eyes, your body, and there's also a shield that can be used with other products to um, help with sunscreen. So it easily fits into your current skincare routine. And for a limited time, our listeners will get an exclusive 15% off One Skin products using the code LEGALAF when you check out at oneskin.co. That's not com, it's .co. Start 2024 off right and give your skin the scientifically proven love it deserves with One Skin. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using code LegalAF at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with legal AF as your code. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Uh, this is a great time to have healthy, beautiful skin. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. 
That's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions. This routine has taken the place of my old routine. OJ, a swig of coffee, and whatever gummy vitamins were on sale. And I wonder why this didn't really work. But with AG1, it's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. Instead of sluggish and run down, it makes me feel energized, focused, and ready to take on the day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre- and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. With AG1, without even thinking about it, I know I'm automatically getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients from Whole Foods. I like to think of it as a nutritional insurance, which with my growing family, I need. I know I'm covering my nutritional bases right from the start of the day. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why I've partnered with them for so long, a product that I've been using and endorsing since I co-founded Legal AF more than three years ago. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash Legal AF. That's drinkag1.com slash Legal AF. Check it out. And we are back. I saw one funny, um, there are a lot of funny comments. I saw one funny comment that, that, and I stand corrected. Fort Pierce is not a sleepy little town. Somebody graduated from Fort Pierce High School and said, it's, <laughs> oh, it's nowheresville. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, go to, I'll go to that. So let's, uh, let's turn to our last topic. And if we have time, um, I mean, I do want to talk about Alabama. Uh, I have a hot take up right now about Alabama and the uh, ruling, which is now negatively impacting people's ability to use IVF as part of their family planning. The University of Alabama having now ruled based on the ruling that they can't provide IVF services to women and families in Alabama because now an unborn embryo has more rights than a woman or husband have in the state of Alabama. We'll talk about, we'll try to touch on that before we finish so I can get Karen's view about all of that. But let's Let's do a quickie, a hit and run here, <laughs> a hit and run hot take on Alex, uh, Alex uh, Spirinoff. I'll frame it, and you you tell me what you think the magistrate's doing, and then what do you think the actual judge sitting in California is doing? And that gives us time for a legal AF breakout about when you pick up a uh, criminal defendant who happens to be flying into one jurisdiction, but the case is pending in another jurisdiction. Who does the arraignment? But who's really responsible for the case and all of that? Very interesting stuff, even between. Federal uh, federal judges and the uh, hierarchy within the federal judge system. The Article Three judge, which is what it sounds like, that's the person who gets nominated and confirmed, comes out of the Constitution. We call that an Article Three judge. And then that lo- other level of judges we call magistrate judges, which are not Article Three judges. So why am I even talking about that? Popak, you're like rambling. Let's bring it home. Okay, here we go. I have to coach myself sometimes. Alexander Smirnoff was an Israeli citizen who was an informant, a confidential human asset or source, a CHS is what it's called in the world of the FBI. And he's cooperating with the FBI and telling them all sorts of loads of bullshit, (laughs) including that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden took $5 million bribes apiece from Burisma, the oil company. Who would believe this? Uh, uh, The Burisma, the oil company, in order for Burisma to both kind of uh, grease the skids to let them go public, a uh, public company in the United States, and to get a special prosecutor off their ass in uh, in Ukraine uh, when Joe Biden was allegedly vice president, except that's completely inconsistent with everything the guy had said until Joe Biden became president, because he had had contacts with the FBI before that and never mentioned that at all. Turned out that he was just an asset of the rush of Russian foreign intelligence being used to try to get their favored candidate, oh, oh, I wonder who that is, Donald Trump elected to interfere with our election. No, it's not Russia hoax. It's real Russia asset in Alexander Smirnov. He got, so he's cooperating. He's part of the milieu of information that the FBI is using to go after Hunter Biden. And then it turns out, and maybe you can speak to this as a prosecutor, what happens when an informant goes south and you have to prosecute your informant? And what does that do to the, I think that's what people want to hear from you, Karen. What does that do to the entire prosecution 
package, if one of your lead witnesses, you now have to turn and fire on because they've become unreliable and, and, and telling lies to the FBI. Well, I'll leave it on this. He flew into Vegas for whatever reason. I, I can think of the obvious reasons and got picked up at the airport because, you know, people, they, they, Interpol and other, other agencies know when you're traveling. And uh, he got, uh, uh, there's, there's an indictment that got unsealed against him, a couple of count indictment for false, false statements to the FBI and other things related to that. And he got arraigned in front of a magistrate judge who was assigned to him in Nevada in federal court. But the judge that's responsible for the case sits in the Central District of California. Uh, it's somebody, I forget his name right now, it'll come to me in a minute. And that's who's really responsible as the Article Three judge over the case. But arraignments have to happen where people are picked up unless there's extradition. We can talk about that too. And, and the government filed a, a very compelling, <laughs> very compelling piece of paper that said this guy should be kept in jail, in detention until his trial. Uh, and then transferred him ultimately over to California because of things like he lied about the amount of money he had in his bank account by millions. Uh, he said he had twenty five hundred dollars when he had eight or nine million dollars. That's a problem. Uh, and he is <laughs> the the indictments about lying to the government. So that's a problem. Uh, and then he's he he's an admitted asset of foreign intelligence trying to interfere with the election, including reporting to a guy who they don't have the name of. They have it as Russian official number two, who's responsible for assassinating uh, uh, officials in other countries. Bad guy. But that's not what the magistrate heard. Take it from there, my partner, Karen Friedman Niffalo. So the business of dealing with confidential informants is a tricky business because look, it's, it's this thing that it's a necessary evil. Law enforcement do, does it. it. And there's a big difference between a cooperator and a confidential informant. A cooperator is somebody who essentially you've brought charges and you flip someone to cooperate against their co-defendants, right? That's someone who you already have uh, evidence against, and and they have to admit what they did, and plead, usually plead guilty, and then they cooperate in exchange for a lenient deal. A confidential informant or a confidential, uh, I forgot what 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 they called this guy. Confidential and, human source. Okay, confidential human source. That's a fancy federal term. Uh, we called them CIs or confidential informants in in the in our in the state, but it's all the same thing. And look, some are paid. I don't know if this guy's paid or not. Some are working off a, a case, um, but typically these are criminals who are in with other criminals. And and it's the, they are kind of this necessary evil for law enforcement. And look, there are some people who are just sort of the guy on the street who wants to make some extra money. And so he's the eyes and ears. But you just never know, right? You never know. These are not these are people who are hanging out with unsavory people, whether or not they are committing crimes with them. But they, you can get a lot of great information from them. But you verify everything they say. You don't just trust them. And what was weird about this was this is somebody who it looks like has been a longtime asset of the FBI, which means he's given a lot of information. Uh, the first thing I thought of was, I wonder what other cases and investigations are going to be impacted by this because he's he lied and he lied in such a way that he has been indicted. And so this is this is what happens when you uh, when you deal with somebody like this this individual and you rely on them and it, it, you do it at your peril. And so, as I said, sometimes it's a necessary, it's a necessary evil. It's the only way in to some, to certain big criminal enterprises or criminal organizations. Sometimes law enforcement uses them to make an introduction of, uh, in, of an undercover, or they use them to get initial information and then they go and build their own case uh, based on that information. So you, you use it, but you don't rely on it to the point where I think they relied on it for Hunter when you're talking about the vice president and his son, right? And, and let's, let's just pivot to, to a little bit about Hunter. Hunter is also, I think, extremely problematic, right? Like he he's a problematic person generally. It's not 
you know, it's not just because he's he's Biden's son. I mean, he's committed crimes and he also is the ne'er do well child of of, you know, a politician who was who was who knows, but probably trying to cash in on the name. Right. Um, and and unfortunately, he's somewhat bringing his father down in the process, you know, and and this but this guy, it turns out, exploited that, you know, Smirnoff exploited that he exploited the fact that that there was, you know, you you mentioned you mentioned the president, you mentioned the president's son or the vice president at the time. People are going to listen, right? And he exploited that, and that and that kind of information should have been something that the FBI, I think, uh, that they that they verified um, and that they never relied on, and uh, and here we are, and somehow it got to got to Congress and that's what they based their impeachment inquiry on was this guy. And, you know, look, good for, good for, um, the special counsel, David Weiss and good for, and good for, um, law enforcement for prosecuting this guy, no matter how good the other information he's given them, you can't do that. This, this, the whole system will collapse if you're allowed to do that. Right. So, because they do rely so much on, on, on confidential informants, you mess with them, you have to come down hard on this guy. And I, I think he's facing 25 years for for doing this and and he should. He absolutely should. You this is this is to me one of the one of the more serious and more egregious violations um I I've seen with with huge stakes with 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 nat with international stakes. I mean this guy it's terrible and and he exploited the fact that that Hunter is is an addict and a criminal and, you know, and, and, and frankly, what's going on in his case right now is, is, you know, I don't know what my computer's doing. Cause I, cause I put my thumb up, but anyway, but you know, what, what Hunter Biden is, is doing right now, I don't love, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like he's, he's selfishly not thinking of the bigger picture and the fact that, you know, he's, uh, you know, that he, he filed all these, these motions through his lawyer. He's aggressively fighting this case, but in doing so, what he's doing is, is, you know, first of all, he committed tax fraud and he had a gun, period, full stop. For him to go out now and say selective prosecution and witch hunt and to parrot all the arguments that Donald Trump says, I, I don't... I think it's it's doing a disservice to his father, to his movement, and to all the work the rest of us are doing. Own up, take you know, take take responsibility for what you did. Take your lumps and and go and 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 deal with it and deal with it like every other person who gets caught and who goes through a hard time. Yes, he's had a sad, a lot of sad things happen to him. But I, I'm sorry, you have to take responsibility for your actions. But for him to turn around and put in legal filings the same exact things that Donald Trump is saying, it delegitimizes our criminal justice system. It delegitimizes the cases against Donald Trump because he's saying it's political. He's saying it's a witch hunt. He's saying all the things that Donald Trump says. And so guess what the average person who doesn't take the time out of their day like me and you and Ben to read all of these all of these legal files, it, it throws throws it up there for for um, for people to just throw their hands up and say it's all the same. He's doing it. He's doing it. It's all political. It delegitimizes the legitimacy of the prosecution of Donald Trump, uh, whether uh, and and of Letitia James case against Donald Trump and his frauds of Alvin Bragg's case because of of his trying to steal the election the first time of the two Jack Smith cases calling the special counsel. Did you see those 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 um, motions that they made saying a special counsel's not legitimate that he didn't get the funding approved again the exact same things that Donald Trump says and, I, and look I can see I can see some of the comments people don't love what I'm saying but I I. See say it how I see it. And I am not, I am never you going never stopped to stop this before. You know what? <laughs> I, I do. And this is how I see it. I, and it is. And, and honestly, to me, he needs to think of the bigger picture and really think this is, this is not a battle. This is a war. And, yeah. and he is not, he does not realize, uh, he does not realize by filing these motions 
and, and calling into question the same things that Donald Trump is doing. He's delegitimizing those prosecutions and well, me, creating the po policy. Well, let me take it from a different perspective, because you, and you come from a prosecutor's world. You spent over 30 years as a prosecutor, and I've spent over 30 years primarily never being a prosecutor, but being a defense lawyer. So my focus is a little bit different. I don't think because he was uh, he was the president's, he is the president's son, that he forfeits the right to raise meritorious um uh, to raise meritorious motions and defenses and seek dismissals of his indictment or nor, nor that he should be gagged from using if it, it's appropriate and if the facts fit, even something that smacks of being similar to Donald Trump. One of the problems that Democrats have is that we're not willing to go there um, at, at the appropriate time and we just let things run over us. And, and, and in Hunter Biden's standpoint, regardless of his dissent into his own personal hell caused by drug use, uh, addiction, uh, porn addiction, sex addiction, and all sorts of bad judgment that comes from that, wh whatever the reason for it is. And let's be frank, um, th th whatever was going on in that household, there are at least two children of Joe Biden, you know, both who are survivors of a terrible tragedy related to the death of the mother um, um, in a terrible car crash and the house there and a father, frankly, that was devoted to the American people um, in terms of being a senator in the public eye since he was 29 all the way through. He's now 81. And so, you know, um, the daughter has had a well-documented too, too well documented a descent into her own personal hell related to drug use, as has Hunter. But I don't think that gives the Republicans the right to use them as political props, drag them into Congress, make them um, try to get their hands on and successfully get their hands on Ashley Biden's personal diary and put and writ that large in filings. So, look, if um, if Abby Lowell, the lawyer who's the new lawyer for Hunter Biden, and he's a great lawyer, he is if he feels he has a merit-based argument of selective vindictive prosecution, I know you're a prosecutor, but I'm telling you from a defense standpoint, then he should raise that issue, even if it means- I'm a defense attorney that, now. Too. I know you are. But even if it means that it backs up on Joe I'm Biden- trying. He shouldn't, <laughs> because he shouldn't forfeit his rights to, to mount a meritorious defense, even if it, in your view, it mimics what Donald Trump is saying. If, if he doesn't have it, and he's the, the the problem with Donald Trump is not that he raises the issue of selective prosecution, vindictive prosecution, um, hack uh, Democratic prosecutors and attorney generals and judges, is that there's no merit to it and that he does it anyway. By contrast, if Abby Lowell is signing pleadings and, sli and signing these nine motions and believes at the end of the day that there is a basis for this, that a federal judge overseeing the case should get to the bottom of, uh, to be frank, I don't think, you said at the top of what we're talking about now, you said that he should take his lumps because he's, you know, I'll just paraphrase, because he's a criminal and he did these bad things and he should just sort of do uh, do it for the rest of our, do, do it for the rest of the country. But I don't have to sit in a cell. Um, and you don't either. And he does. And so, you know, when you're staring, as you know, because <laughs> you were holding the barrel, when you're staring down the barrel of potentially losing your liberty for a period of time, if you've got a merit argument, you make that merit argument regardless of who your daddy is. Um, and so we will see. I mean, I've looked at the motions. I assume Abby's got the goods to back them up. If he doesn't, he's not going to win these motions. That's the good thing about our justice system. That's why a person sits in a black robe. But I don't want it. I, for me, I'm fine with him if he's got the merit-based arguments to make them, even if uh, you know it sort of rings us, us it seems to be taken out partially out of a Trump playbook. Because I, if we just sit on our hands, you see what the Republicans and MAGA are going to do to us, which is drag us into Congress, impeach people that, that have no right to be impeached, and the rest. So but this is no, the debate. I, I say debate every time I write the note for the show, because we're going to, there's things that you and I are uh, at core, at core and value and morality, 100% eye to eye. Yeah, On look, tactics but, and strategy, sometimes we disagree. So look, there, and there's there's fair comment saying Hunt, you can't compare Hunter to Pope. Look, I love the co I love what I love being able to read the comments. Wait, and they're, wait, they're comparing Hunter to me? No, no, there's oh. no to, to Trump. They're oh, saying okay. I. They saying I shouldn't. They're saying that me comparing Trump and Hunter is an unfair comparison, and I agree with that. And I I'm not 
I'm not trying to compare them. What I'm, well, I guess what I'm suggesting is that our, our, again, I'm coming from a certain perspective, but our prisons around this country are filled by and large with 90 something percent black and brown people who some possess guns, most are addicts, many have trauma. And it just, you, but then you have, you have Donald, you have, um, you have Hunter Biden who absolutely did not live a perfect life and committed crimes. He admitted to them, right? One of them is based on statements he made in a book about it. And Joe Biden, like it or not, yes, he is not involved, but it's his, the father, put a, you know put a special prosecutor in place to investigate it and prosecute it and that's what's happening and he left the 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 prosecutor that Donald Trump put there and to now then go and call that special prosecutor that your that frankly your father's uh department of justice put in place to call that illegitimate i just think is especially because it you did do you know you there are certain things that you did do I, I i do think it is having an impact i'm not trying to say that what he did and donald trump did are equivalent in any sense whatsoever i'm just saying i i, I just don't if i know i know you're never going to make this a topic on a midweek again the hunter thing i'll let you and ben talk about it but i just this is my perspective wait wait no we will <laughs> We will. I, by the way, I like looking at the chat and seeing, you know, the it, it. We are here to have an honest and um, in, informative, insightful debate, and some and great things come from that. And I think that's why people tune in here. I like those comments, and also somebody that said I look like Count Chocula today with my. No, with people my... love your glasses today. <laughs> somebody wrote you look like Dracula. I wrote no, it's Count Chocula. But and okay. pe people are also noticing my red lipstick. No, they love your lipstick. We need a... new. it's new, and you want to know who inspired it? There's an inspiration for your lipstick. Oh, I've never worn lipstick a day in my life, other than very, very subtle. Who? I, I'm not a lipstick person. Who? This is honestly true. Yeah, people got it. Taylor Swift. She looks so good in red lipstick. Get the illegal AF out of here. Taylor I, Swift I swear to God, I swear to God. I, I have a crush on Taylor Swift. I, I just think because I, I think she's amazing. And I'm a Swifty. What can I say? I think she's amazing. And I just think she wears this red lipstick. And it's so dramatic. Like, it's so... I love it. And I was like, I'm going to try it anyway. So I appreciate that people have noticed. And <laughs> no, you get, you're getting, it's, it's running, it's running neck and neck. Your Hunter Biden comments and your lipstick is there. The, the I know. People don't like, people don't like it. And the, the Hunter Biden stuff, but I, I just, sorry. I, I, and this That's just, right. I'm the one thing, the one thing you, I, you'll at least know uh, is I'm, I'm honest. Right. I, what do I? What, what's what is my motto? I use in my hot takes. We don't, don't blow, blow smoke, smoke or, or sunshine. sunshine. I know. I know. But you don't I. Like it. This is not yeah. the show for you. And yeah. um, you know. All right. So listen. You want to. You want to do like literally like three or four minutes just to touch on. And I want to get really let yeah. you do talking on Alabama. Yeah, the, the Alabama thing is, yeah. yeah, and I saw your hot take and, yeah. and you know, it was incredible how you shared your personal story and your experience with, you know, you and your wife with, um, with IVF and, and for, look, for the people who, who don't know about this ruling, the Alabama Supreme Court essentially ruled that, um, that an embryo that is frozen and out of a woman's uterus. So, you know, just the IVF process, they extract an egg, they extract sperm, they put them together and um, they grow it up to, I think, 14 days. And at a certain point, they may or may not implant them into the uterus, uh, into a woman's uterus. And, um, and, uh, and many of them are stored, right, in, in this, um, like, I think they're frozen actually. Um, and they're kept there. Some people, some never get used, right? Some, some people keep them there and, and may, may use them. Some never do. Uh, there's, there's, there's famous court battles of celebrities fighting over, over 
embryos and who they belong to. I mean, you know, this is, this is a thing. And, and somehow a patient got into the room where these were frozen and touched and picked them up. I, I, that, that's the whole backstory that I, I'd love to know what, what, what they were doing in there and why they picked them up. And I guess the, the ice, the dry ice that they used to, to freeze them burned their hand and they dropped them. And so they were this, they were sued for um, essentially wrongful death of, of these embryos. And it basically the Supreme court in a ruling that was completely filled with um, religious references um, and you know this was in a concurring opinion but but um but the chief judge parker um of this court said in the concurring opinion even before even before birth all human beings have the image of god and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory i mean that that's in a court opinion <laughs> even if you believe that life begins at conception it putting god at that level, Christian God at that level into a decision really flies in the face of the separation of church and state. But, you know, this impacts, I think, 10% of women who've received some sort of fertility treatment. Um, this impacts decisions now about what people will do. And, and certainly in Alabama, they have stopped for now. They have stopped. Uh, they won't, they won't go any, they'll extract the, the eggs, but they won't fertilize them and they won't store them and because unborn children, essentially, these are considered unborn children, even if they're not in the womb. And, and you know this comes from the un, this comes from the Alabama Wrongful Death of a Minor Act. It was enacted in 1975, and they ruled for the first time that this could be a wrongful death claim um, because an embryo is a person, um, even if you know it's it's never been implanted in a person. And they look they used a lot of examples. Um, they used a lot of examples of of the extreme of of things that could happen. What if they science gets to the point where they can grow an embryo outside the womb the entire time? Are you allowed to? Uh, you know, at what point is it a child? Is it you know? It's very much a life begins at the moment of fertilization, and and it de it definitely um, made me think about about where the implications in in criminal law too right if if an embryo uh if an embryo is a person um you know that could have implications for murder and, and other types of of crimes ultimately but it just really goes to show what the dobbs decision overturning roe versus wade and putting this in the hands of the states you know alabama is one of the states that has has um has this provision in the constitution, right? Where abortion at any time is illegal and uh, you can't have an abortion, but now you can't have fertility treatments in Alabama. Nobody's doctors aren't going to do it while they, while they review what all this means. But essentially right now it is um, on pause and it's going to impact a lot, a lot of families or people who are trying to start families um, and it, it's just really, you know, for, for, for the Republicans who, who their entire message is all about get government out of our lives. Um, they really do want to control women. And, uh, and, and look, I don't, I don't want to just say women, cause again, your, your story and the fact that you shared on your hot take Popak, what really struck me with that is, is, you know, I always talk about it as a woman's issue, but it really isn't, you know, you, you wanted to have a baby just as much as your wife. Like this was a, this is a, and, and it, it, you know, can impact all sorts of, of people who are trying to start families, not just, um, you know, not just the, you know, not just a person with a uterus who's going to be the one carrying the baby. Um, it could, it could absolutely impact, uh, anybody wanting to start a family. And so, and so it really, this is just, this was a really, um, really sad and um, non theoretical, non hypothetical, tragic consequence, I think of 
of the Dobbs decision. Yeah, there's 12 states that have, and Alabama's joined them, that uh, it's called the, the March Towards Personhood, making a person, having all the rights of a person at the moment of fertilization. If I was in Alabama, there's no way my wife and I would ever consider doing IVF. Um, we were fortunate that in between our IVF treatments, um, my wife got pregnant the old fashioned way, but we were fully prepared and we have, to be frank, we have, um, embryos, at least two of them that are on ice or frozen that we may use in the future, but there were others that were not viable after they did the genetic testing and other testing. And they were, um, they're not, we're, we don't, we don't have them any longer in Alabama. We, we could be, I would, I would assume there's no reason to believe that that wouldn't naturally lead to a prosecution for, uh, for a murder. Um, there's no way it, was, it, it would be completely inconsistent with the ruling they just made that, 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 that being whatever that is, uh, regardless of your religious belief, scientifically, whatever it is, is a person. Well, if it's a person, then it can be murdered. And uh, there's nobody, that's why there's no way an IVF clinic can operate in Alabama at, or any of the other 11 states, uh, which means that uh, we're back to, um, we're back to a divided country, red and blue off the Dobbs decision, because there, we have, we've lost equal protection under the law because a Michael Popak and his wife in Alabama does not have the same rights as I have here in New York. And they should, and they should be able to have the luxury and the freedom, that's a better word, the freedom and the civil rights, and for a woman, the woman's bodily autonomy to make these decisions about whether to carry uh, a being to term, an embryo to fetus to term or not, and these other earlier decisions, and not be uh, dissuaded because the chief justice of your local Supreme Court wants to quote the Bible and the face of God in every living creature, um, you know, as as the justification for the decision. If anybody thought that this was based on science, it is not based on science. Just as the fetal heartbeat states for abortion, outlawing abortion, are not based on science either. And I take this very personally because I've been public about, you know, my wife and I are are you know very far along in a pregnancy, and and so I'm I'm pretty well versed in all facets of this in real time. And, and that's why I felt compelled to do the hot take on it. But I, you know, I wanted to get your perspective on it as a mother, as a mother of children that are having children and have had children about what it would be like. And we've got a, the, that I'm a is grandma. The, I'm a grandmother. Oh yeah. Grandma. Well, I said a mother of children. <laughs> I, know, children. I know. That's that, was my, that was my way of saying you're a grandmother. I know the great, the great, the greatest thing that's, that's happened yeah. to me, frankly, is the grant is being a grandmother. I will say yeah. it's, it's amazing, but really quick, I just want to share one more thing about this uh, this ruling I, that I thought was so interesting. Was was so much can be gleaned from the words that are used, right? From the phraseology and from the way things are framed in this ruling. And um, the and I, the, there's two things I, I found: one interesting, one depressing. Um, the interesting thing was they started with this is a wrongful death claim, and all parties, meaning the plaintiffs and the defense and the court, this is what it said, all parties and the court agree that an unborn child is a genetically unique human being who life, whose life begins at fertilization and ends at death. So that, it was interesting to me that, that they all agreed, the court took it as a given that the, that the plaintiffs, the defendant, and the court all think that life begins at fertilization. And as soon as they said that, there was no other place to go than this ruling. And, this, and the thing that was also interesting is there are multiple times in there where they would use the following word. So they'd say, is there an unwritten exception to the rule for unborn children not physically in utero at the time they are killed? Okay. They kept talking about killing the embryo. When you use language, I mean, so there's no doubt where that decision was going. If that's your viewpoint that you are killing a human and, and that is right. Like then, you know, sort of where it's going. So it was just, even just the wording, this wasn't even a close call for them, you know, that they view this as murder. So, yeah, when they use that, you know, I did it in the hot take when they use pregnant word. No, that's the wrong word. When they use uh, trigger words, 
you know, you know, you know exactly where they're going. The unborn, just using the term as you said, unborn child. That that's that personhood. That's the personhood that they're using, which has been, you know, the 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 uh, anti-abortion group has been using for years, and now they got their hands on the Supreme Court. All the members of the Supreme Court, including the one woman on the Supreme Court, voted for this in Alabama. And this is the problem of when you have a constitutional, a right that's enshrined in the United States Constitution versus leaving it to each state legislature to do their own bidding. And this is the problem because when you and I were in law school, we learned about, you know, Griswold, you know, these various cases, in Supreme Court precedent that were moving towards establishing more and more freedom and bodily autonomy and about family planning and reproductive rights and a woman's right to choose. And so Roe versus Wade, which is which which was just one in a series of decisions that made me proud to be an American and a proud to live under that, that under the protection of our constitution. But now with this MAGA right wing a Supreme Court that goes out of their way to remove the separation of church and state, to um, do everything they can to undermine a woman's bodily autonomy, we now live in a different hellscape of a world when it comes to that. And now we're letting it be uh, put up for bid uh, in state by state, meaning we're now going to have half the states that are going to respect a woman and make her an equal and in family planning decisions and half the states that aren't. And that's not the America that I thought we were going to live in in 2024. But but here we are. I hate to end it on such a dour note. Let's go back to the lipstick. <laughs> Where's Karen? <laughs> I can't, we can't end it on that. You know what? So that, <laughs> that, that ad that I did for one yeah. skin, I yeah. actually, I actually didn't wear makeup because I wanted people to see, you know, I look at the picture because I, I was watching it well, as we we're watching it. I'm going, oh God, you know, but I was watching it, but I purposely didn't wear makeup because we all know, everybody knows I, I'm a, I'm a big user of the touch up your appearance feature on, you know, the, the cameras. Look, I'm, I'm just, did Again, I'm that? on it. I'm on it. Oh, I, I clicked that little button. It says touch up my appearance. I just get know? giant glasses and then nobody looks. <laughs> nobody looks Look, at my You face. know, you gotta, I'm a grandmother. I gotta fight, I gotta fight this back with every ounce that I can. Yeah. You know, it's 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 coming, it's it is what it is. I am um, go ahead, Karen. Tell me. No, no, I'm just saying. So, but I wanted people to see because I really because my mom, I go now. I'm gonna talk about my mom, who's you know the most amazing person I know. My mom tells me like like it is, right? She's a little bit of a savage, and so um, so my my mom will be the one who will tell me exactly, you know, it's time to do your hair, you know, see some grays. And I saw him on the podcast. I'm like, okay, mom, thanks a lot. But she saw me, and she's she looked at my skin, and she's like, oh my god, you know, you look great. What are you doing? And I was like, it's this new thing, mom. It's going great. So I wanted people to actually see. So and now so I'm wearing lipstick. Set up time with for me and Mrs. Friedman to do a consultation. I think she'd be great to give me notes. <laughs> Trust me. You know, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you one time my mom said to me, she, literally, this is a true story, and I'll just tell you what a savage, amazing woman she is, but she's a savage. I was every. I think if people know I'm I'm a legal analyst on CNN, and when you go on CNN, they do your hair and makeup right before you go on, and my mom just texting with me, hey, you know, what are you doing right now? And so I took a selfie and I was in the hair and makeup chair, you know, just whatever, looking like you're getting your makeup done. <laughs> all I get back, all I get back from my mom is she, she goes into the photo and she zooms in to this part of my head. That's all you see back. And you can see this white line, right? Because whatever, I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. I am, I'm gray. So you can see it. And that's all she sends back with, without a comment, <laughs> without a comment. <laughs> and it was her way of like, you know, and so I was like, oh, so the, the hair and makeup people, they were lovely. They're like, they spray oh, paint they, you. They, it's, they, you, know, so you can get on TV. I'm like, you got to do it for my mom. Anyway. So I just I thought you were going to tell, tell you. me your mom sent back. What are you doing at Madame Tussauds wax museum? Ha <laughs> uh -huh. no, no. My, so my mother will tell you exactly. Cause she's, she's, my mother's amazing. 
Yeah. So she, you know, I get I get a lot of my strength from her. So, I but bet, she's she's I a bet. savage. I, do too. I get a lot of strength from my mother. So there we are. That's a better way to end the podcast. We've reached the end of another edition <laughs> of Legal AF Midweek. I'm tan, ready, and rested. I'm so I couldn't wait to get on the on the microphone today with um, my co-anchor Karen Freeman Nifolo. Saw her briefly. I was holed up on holiday and did the. We just had to all get together. And join together and add bandwidth to analyze everything that happened last week. But I love I love this time with you. And uh, we will pick up because there's a lot that's going to be happening tomorrow as in every day in our lives at the intersection of law, politics, and justice. And we cover it in a way that's unique. I'm not going to critique other places that do who try to do what we do, but I think we do it in a very unique way here on the Midas Touch Network. Um, if you want to support what we're doing, everything I'm going to talk about next is free. It is a free subscribe to the Midas Touch YouTube channel. They're over 2 million. We're going to get the 3 million before election day with your help, not just your help, but with uh, you kind of, you can take one of our legal AF after darks. And for those that already know the show, rather than sort of go, oh crap, I've already seen this hot take. Take that clip, use it as a gateway podlet and send it to people in your life and say, Hey, you know, that show legal AF that I really like. Um, why don't you take a listen? This is like one 10 minute investment. And then maybe they'll join, uh, join our audience, which would be great. Um, in, and that's one way. So your free subscription and that go over to the audio. The audio is very important. Some people might wonder, because a lot of people just listen to the audio and there's a whole nother group of people that just watch us on YouTube and both are equally important and they're equally important to us because um, the, our rankings, let's be frank, our rankings are important for many, many reasons that are obvious, uh, you know, and so uh, how high we are ranked is a function, we think, because who really knows how these algorithms work, is a function of how long people listen, how they engage with us in terms of comments or thumbs up and things like that. And Apple rates us, Spotify, Google, and the rest. So if you've already watched this on YouTube, go over and kind of click and listen for a bit over on the audio versions um, and that, and go back and forth. That helps as well. Then that's all free. Everything I just said is free. If you wanted to work, uh, if you wanted, you know, fly the flag of legal AF, we've got a merchandise store under Midas Touch. There it is now, Salty, who you know, some people asked, who is Salty? He is our producer. Salty's the best. Yeah. If without him, there's no, sh literally, there's no show. If you'd see how many times Karen and I are trying to figure out our microphone and our camera before we start, we'd have no show. So, uh, are you can not just that. He looks things up in the mid show and like sends oh, it yeah. to us. If we, if we, if we can't think of something or forget it, he, yes. he kind of, he anticipates what we're going to do and he'll put stuff up. He's yeah. salty. Amazing. We have a chat that goes on here along the side. We kind of keep each other honest during the chat. You know, if I make a mistake or a malaprop or something, you know, Karen will weigh in. If I if I hear something that she said, um, uh, you know, I've done it with Ben too. Ben, ben will say, um, <laughs> Ben once called me Cohen. He goes, Michael Cohen, what do you think about this? And I go, I think we stopped it. I was like, stop. <laughs> Wrong show, Ben. <laughs> he goes, what did I say? <laughs> Wrong Michael. Wrong Michael. Wrong Michael. Um, but Michael Cohen and I are going to be together on Mea Culpa next, which will be, which is fun. My first time on there. And we're going to have him. I don't know if it's with you and me or me and Ben, but we're going to have Michael Cohen on before he testifies, lead witness in the Stormy Daniels hush money cover up case business record fraud case brought by your old office, the Manhattan DA, starting March 25th. we got a lot to do on Thursday. We'll pick it up on, on hot takes that the three leaders of Legal AF will do between now and Saturday. And Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, come join Ben Mycellus and me for the weekend edition of Legal AF. So until our next Legal AF together, our next series of hot takes, this is Michael Popak, Karen Friedman-Ignifolo. Shout out to the Legal AFers and the Midas Mighty.